The Science of Prophethood by Abdullah Samir Was a prophet sincere and telling the truth, or was he a liar? Many people wonder how to understand the concept of prophethood. I believe many of the great prophets of the past were in fact truly sincere, believing they were speaking to God. Let us hear Dr. Muhammad Gilan, a Muslim and a student of neuroscience, share his reflections. If you're in my field specifically, neuroscience, it's filled with atheists. It's like an atheist party in my lab. Because you can explain a lot, and I can tell you from personal experience, when I first started, you can get really shaken up if you don't have grounding in your aqidah. You can get very shaken up, because I can give you right now arguments that if you don't know the background of them, you could explain, for example, prophecy, messengership, you know, the prophets generally, to be a schizotype type of mental illness, where they can actually function by and large normally. And there are clinical cases, those who are in neurology know this. There are clinical cases, you can go to the hospital and see people that speak about God, speak about religion, come up with like lengthy treatises, come up with things that are very profound philosophically speaking, and so that, if you don't know the background of it, if you don't know the background of your own Prophet, وسلم, if you don't know what his personality was like, what people said about him, if you don't know a lot of this stuff, if you don't have the background, you're going to get shaken up. If you don't have the background, you are going to be shaken up. He's saying that using neuroscience, we can explain prophethood. We can see clinical cases of individuals who function by and large normally, but due to the brain dysfunction, they speak about God, speak about religion, come up with lengthy treatises, come up with things that are very profound philosophically. These are people who are otherwise normal. They aren't what you think of when someone says crazy people who go around talking to themselves or babbling incoherently. These are otherwise perfectly functioning individuals who think God spoke to them or they are God, depending on the cultural reference points. According to the Sirah, Muhammad thought he was possessed. This is how he interpreted the strange experiences he had. In the following clip, this father speaks about how his son John had epileptic fits that changed his life and made him think he was like God or like a prophet. Very first seizure I can remember, he was 17 years old. Okay, so until and 17, he was kind of pretty much like any other kid. He went through the usual adolescent problem. Very much but, so, yeah. But otherwise, was your family, are you religious or is he religious at, before that time? Uh, not, uh, not, no. He has a seizure, he'll want to talk philosophy. want to discuss all the things that are floating around in this stew he's got up here that he's trying to reconstruct. Mm -hmm. Thoughts that he may have had just, just floating through his mind while he was in a seizure mode uh -huh. may come surfacing. I see, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. So, but also uh, you said he's become more emotional because, because of the seizure, so that's, mm -hmm. that's helpful too. Much more sensitive, but oddly enough, not in regards to himself, okay? okay. But in regards to atrocities, disasters, things like that, anywhere and everywhere. Oh. Wrongs done to other people. Oh my God. And you know what? I am so right in my own head. I know I could go out there and get people to follow me. <laughs> Not like these wackos with sheets on their heads. Not like those idiots. Right. But now it's just the new generation of the prophets yep. and uh, were all the prophets people that were flopping around on the ground is that what this whole message was the gift from the gods this whole time that's possible isn't it yeah i've never been religious ever people say no you can't see into the future uh, -uh. that's what that gift is but you got to pay for it by getting slammed around now, why do these patients have intense religious experiences when they have these seizures? And why do they become preoccupied with theological and religious matters even in between seizures? One possibility is that the seizure activity in the temporal lobe somehow creates all kinds of odd, strange emotions in the person's mind, in the person's brain. And this welling up of bizarre emotions may be interpreted by the patient as, as visits from another world uh, or as God is visiting me. Maybe that's the only way he can make sense of this welter of strange emotions uh, going on in his brain. How do we explain this? 
Dr. Lama Chandran, neuroscientist, explains why our brain might be wired this way. There is no specific area in the temporal lobe concerned with God, but it's possible there are parts of the temporal lobes whose activity is somehow conducive to religious belief. Now, this seems unlikely, but it might be true. Now, why might we have neural machinery in the temporal lobes for belief in religion? Well, belief in religion is widespread. Every tribe, every society has some form of religious worship. And maybe the reason it evolved, if it did evolve, is that it is conducive to the stability of society. Here's another clinical example of a man who had no interest in poetry until he had a seizure at age 53. It describes how people with this syndrome often have an intense preoccupation with moral or philosophical issues, just like prophets do. Case Report a 58-year-old right-handed man complained of being driven to write poetry. For five years, he experienced words as continuously rhyming in his head and felt the need to write them down and show his writings to others. He did not talk in rhyme, write excessively in non-rhyme, or read poetry. The patient had not had a preoccupation with poetry until age 53 when he had the subacute onset of behavioral changes. In this article on Aeon called The God Effect, Patrick McNamara, Associate Professor of Neurology and Psychiatry at the Boston University School of Medicine and a professor at North Central University states, Throughout the centuries, bountiful dopamine has given rise to gifted leaders and peacemakers, for example, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Catherine of Siena, innovators like Zoroastra, seers like the Buddha, warriors like Napoleon or Joan of Arc, teachers of world civilizations like Confucius, and visionaries like Lao Tzu. Some of them founded not only enduring religious traditions, but also profoundly influenced the cultures and civilizations associated with those traditions. But dopamine-fueled religion has also unleashed monsters. Jim Jones, the minister who persuaded hundreds of his followers to commit suicide, and the cult Aum Shrenrikyo, whose leader had his adherents release sarin gas on the subways of Japan. Think of the fanatic terrorists of Al-Qaeda, who gave their lives to attack New York's Twin Towers and the Pentagon on 11 September 2001. So in this article, Professor McNamara scientifically demonstrates that high levels of dopamine can make people religious. Please read the following article if you're interested in more details on how he tested this. Next, let us discuss some ways how high dopamine levels can occur. One way is by drugs. Hallucinogenic drugs such as psilocybin and LSD, which indirectly stimulate dopamine activity in the brain's frontal lobes, can produce religious experiences even in the avowedly non-religious. These hallucinogens produce vivid imagery sometimes along with near-psychotic breaks or intense spiritual experience, all tied to stimulation of dopamine receptors on neurons in the limbic system, the seed of emotion, located in the midbrain, and in the prefrontal cortex, the upper brain that's the center of complex thought. There's more. Not just drugs, but intense meditation. Intense meditation and long periods of sensory deprivation can also trigger something in the mind. Is it possible that something happened in the mind of Muhammad at Mount Hira? On his blog, Dr. Ido Shonin describes that over-intensive meditation practice can actually induce psychotic episodes, including in people who do not have a history of psychiatric illness. Now, we're talking about the 7th century, where psychiatric illnesses would have been completely undiagnosed and untreated. People were more likely to assume that they were possessed by a jinn than to understand the real cause was something not working properly in their mind. The doctor continues by mentioning a summary of the cases he came across in the peer-reviewed clinical and scientific literature. Did you ever notice that early on in Muhammad's life, the revelation came rarely, while later on it occurred on demand? According to the Sira, there were large gaps in the revelation early on, where, where Muhammad was even depressed, wondering if his God had abandoned him. Yet later in his life, he came up with revelation on demand, allowing him to marry as many women as he wanted, telling his companions off for staying too long in his house after dinner, and so on. This is another sign that Muhammad may have felt something real, but then used it to his advantage when he saw people believing in him. 
Why would God use a method to communicate with us that is indistinguishable from psychological disorders? What we can learn from this is that prophethood can be explained by neuroscience. It is completely normal that some people thought God was talking to them in a time and place where these issues couldn't be diagnosed or treated and that superstition prevailed. This phenomena of prophethood can come about due to an epileptic seizure occurring in the brain and can possibly even be triggered from intense, long-term meditation. When we look at Muhammad's life, we don't need to know for sure. This can help us make sense of what happened, but really, when we look at the content of the Quran, we know that even if he spoke to God, God did not speak to him. If you would like to know more about this topic, check out Muhammad in the Light of Medicine and Science by Brother Zashid. We spent two years researching this topic and did a fantastic job putting together the evidence in light of modern science. I encourage you to check it out. Also, before you go, don't forget to subscribe so you can keep up to date with my latest videos. Thanks for watching.